interesting. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> so let us see the second part of this uh, part in in um, of today's class, right? Okay, so. Okay, so let's talk about databases. <clears throat> Module overview. Well, Amazon Relation of Database, RDS, Amazon DynamoDB, Amazon Redshift, Amazon Aurora, Amazon RDS console demos, Amazon DynamoDB console does a demo route two. The Slab 5, build your uh, DB server and interact with your DB using an app and a TVD da database case study, the knowledge check. Guys, are you doing the labs? Yes. I, well, they are important, okay? They're important to understand the console better, you know, and get to know AWS a little bit more. So after completing this module, you should be able to explain Amazon Relational Database Service, or RDS, identify the functionality in Amazon RDS, explain Amazon DynamoDB, identify the functionality in Amazon DynamoDB, uh, explain Amazon Redshift, explain Amazon Aurora, and perform tasks in an RDS database, such as launching, configuring, and interacting. Okay. So now, let's see RDS. Okay. Well, so welcome to the introduction to the foundational database service. And this is available in our in AWS. Right now, this module will cover uh, this guy. Right, we're going to review the differences between a managed and unmanaged service in relation to Amazon RDS. Okay, so well, here we have managed, unmanaged, and managed. Okay, unmanaged services are typically provisioned in discrete portion, portions as specified by the user, right? So you must manage how the service responds to changes in load, errors, and situations where resources become unavailable. So let's say that you launch a web server on an Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud, EC2 instance, right? Because Amazon EC2 instance is an own managed solution, that web server will not scale to handle increased traffic load or replace unhealthy instances with healthy ones, healthy ones, unless you specify that you use a scaling solution such as AWS Autoscaling. Okay. So the benefit to using an unmanaged service is that you have more fine-tuned control over how your solution handles changes in load, errors, and situations where resources become unavailable. So that's unmanaged, right? Now, I suppose to manage, right? Managed services require the user to configure them, right? For example, you create an Amazon simple storage service bucket, an S3 bucket, and then set permissions for it. However, managed services typically require less configuration. Say that you have Elastic website, a static website, that you host in a cloud-based storage solution, such as Amazon uh, S3. The static website does not have a web server. However, because Amazon S3 is a managed solution, features such as scaling, fault tolerance, and availability will be handled automatically and internally by Amazon S3. Okay. Now, 
We're going to see the challenges of running an unmanaged standalone relational database. And then we're going to learn how Amazon RDS addresses these challenges. Okay. So what are the challenges of relational databases? Well, we have the server maintenance and energy footprint factor, right? You're responsible for several administrative tasks. And one of them is this one that I just mentioned, right? So you have to maintain the software, right? Installation and patching on database backups. Okay, that will be a relational database, a traditional one. Okay, you have to ensure that it's highly available. You will be limited as to scalability. It's gonna be hard for you to scale, right? The data security is gonna be another problem that you may encounter as well, okay? So there's so many things that you have to do when you have a relational database. You have to install the operating system, you have to do the patching and all that, okay? So that's, that's the thing of having an unmanaged database, right? It's not managed by AWS, it's not, you, you have to manage it. You're the one that have to make sure that this is, you know, properly running, right? When it comes to RDS, like we said, we said before, it's a managed service, right? That sets up and operates a relational database in the cloud, right? To address the challenges of running an unmanaged standalone relational database, AWS provides this service, right? Without any ongoing administration. So it will provide a cost efficient and resizable capacity while automating time consuming administrative tasks. It will enable you to focus on your application so that you can give applications the performance, high availability, security, and compat compatibility that they need. With this guy, with Amazon RDS, your primary focus is your data and optimizing your application. The rest is taken care of by AWS. Okay? So, of course, that you have to deal with the users, that's IAM, right? The application servers and RDS is in the cloud. All of this is managed by AWS, right? You don't have to deal with any servers in the back end because it's a managed service, right? That's the advantage of having a managed service versus an unmanaged service. So this is what happens. And remember guys that I show you, I think it was in this class when I show you guys um, install a MySQL server in an EC2 instance. Was, was that in this class? No. Was that here? Yes, it no. was. Yes. Yes, it was. Yes, I, I, I created an EC2 instance and I install my SQL server, remember? And I could query yes, the, yes. The, 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 the tables. I created a database, I created tables. Remember all that? That is this guy here in the middle. This guy in the middle, right? But let's see the worst case scenario is when you have it in on-premises, okay? When you have it on-premises. Do you have to take care of everything? Application optimization, scaling, high availability, database backups, database software patches, database software installs, operating system patches, operating system install, server maintenance, rack and stack servers, power, ventilation, air conditioning, heating, network, all of that you have to take care of that, right? That's when you have it on premises. And that's one of the huge disadvantages of having your databases on premises. Now you have two solutions in the cloud. You have this one here and this one here. This one is what we did the Saturday before the last, because last was uh, the Thanksgiving weekend. So we install, we had to install the server. Did we not? 
We have to install the server, right? Now, if you want to maintain that server, you have to make, you have to do it, right? If you want that server maintained, you have to do it. If you want that server updated, you have to do it. If you have that one that server upgraded, you have to upgrade it. You have to patch it. You have to do the backups. Everything has to be done by you, right? The only thing that AWS does is rack and stock servers and power and, and, and do the heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and the network, right? But when we have this solution here, right, the only thing that we have to take care of is the application optimization. It's the only thing. It means that the rest of the things that I was doing here and here would be done by AWS, not by me. Okay? And that is the advantage of having a managed service. Okay? This is unmanaged. EC2 is unmanaged, right? And this is completely unmanaged because you're not in the cloud, right? This is managed. I only focus on optimizing my code, my application, right? My queries, everything that I need to do. And then the rest, I just leave it to AWS. That's the main difference between unmanaged and managed services. Don't forget that. Okay. There's one guy here that has that and is Amazon Aurora. Aurora is proprietary of AWS. It means that AWS manages Aurora. Okay. You reduce your administrative responsibilities completely. And by just moving to the cloud, you can automatically scale your database, enable high availability, right? And simply, you can manage backups and perform patching, right? And then by doing that, you can focus on what really matters most, which is optimizing your application and just, you know, improving your customer service. The only thing that you manage with managed services is the optimize, optimization of the application. The rest is managed by AWS. AWS will scale resources, manage power, servers, and perform maintenance. All of that is taken care of by AWS. So offloading these operations to the managed, to the managed Amazon RDS service reduces your operational workload and the costs that are associated with re your relational database. You will now go through a brief overview of the int service and a few potential use cases in the next slides, okay? We have an RDS instance here, right? The DV, DV instance class. I cannot hear anything. Professor, you are new. Hello, so we have Amazon RDS, and then we have the DB instance class, CPU, memory, network performance, right? And then you have the instance, instance storage, magnetic, gener uh, general purpose, solid state drive or SSD and provision IOPS, okay? So these are the six, the six uh, engines that, you, that RDS supports. Amazon Aurora, Amazon Aurora, Microsoft's uh, SQL Server, PostgreSQL, MariaDB, 
and Oracle. Okay. So don't forget those sticks. So this is Amazon RDS in a private uh, cloud, the, the virtual private cloud in VPC. Uh, you will pull them, I mean, it's good practice to pull them in a private subnet where no one can access it, all right? Then you can have two availability zones and this is called multi-AZ. So multi-AZ is for failover, right? And this is for high availability. If you want to make your database highly available, then have two availability zone and enable multi-AZ when you create the database, right? And you will have a standby database, right? And that's called standby. And people call it slave, a slave database, right? And this guy, this guy will be um, updated synchronously. So whenever you write to the master database, this one will be updated synchronously. So it's gonna be at the same time, it's gonna be updated. So when something happens in this availability zone, you have to fail over to the next one, then this will be updated, okay? So this is a standby instance. It we're not doing anything, it's just waiting there, standing by, uh, just in case this, this, this one goes down. So when that one goes down, what happens is this one, you know, the, this application here, right? This application here will just start fetching information from, from the, this database here. So the sequence replication minimizes the potential, the potential for data loss, because your application uh, referenced the database by name by using the Amazon RDS domain name system, the DNS endpoint. Remember that the database has a DNS, right? But when you don't have to change the DNS in your application code to use the standby copy for failover, okay? You don't need to do anything, anything here. Now, this is for high availability, right? Multi AZ, and this is for performance. If you want to improve the performance, then you create uh, a read replica, right? So a read replica, what happens with this, that the replication is asynchronous. So it means that there's some be, there are gonna be some, some uh, delay there, okay? There's gonna be some delay, okay? It can be promoted to a primary, uh, to a primary database if needed. Okay, you use heavy read heavy database workloads and offload read queries. Okay, that's basically for performance to improve the performance of the database. Okay, so this is application is just writing to this primary database. Right, and asynchronously, it's been replicated in the read replica. Okay, so this is only for read, right? For reads, it's a read replica, and this is for write and read. So whenever this needs to be, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of requests here, right? And then you want to offload this database and just you know release. A lot of the, the load and burden from this database, you can use a read replica and then the performance of your application is going to improve remarkably, okay? But just bear in mind that there's some delay in the replication here because it's, it's not synchronous. Okay. So read replicas can be created in a different region than the primary database. This feature can help satisfy disaster recovery requirements or reduce latency by directing reads to a re replica that is closer to the users. What are the use cases of RDS? Well, 
It works well for web and mobile applications that need uh, a database with high throughput, massive storage scalability, and high availability. Right? Now, because Amazon RDS does not have any licensing constraints, licensing constraints, it fits the variable use patter, pattern of these applications. So for small and large e-commerce business, Amazon RDS provides a flexible, secure, and low cost database solutions for online sales and retailing. Okay. Now for mobile and online games, as they require a database platform for high, with high throughput and availability, Amazon RDS will be good for this one too. And it will manage the database infrastructure, right? So game, game developers do not need to worry about provisioning, scaling, or monitoring database servers. When to use Amazon RDS? Well, you use it when you need complex transactions or complex queries, right? So if you need joins, things like that, you will use RDS because remember the RDS is a SQL database, right? It's a SQL database. Whereas DynamoDB is a NoSQL database. So for, for complex, for complex transaction, complex queries, then you would not use DynamoDB. Instead, you use um, RDS. Now, what is a median to high query or write rate, write rate up to up to 30,000 IOPS, which is 15,000 for reads and 15,000 for writes, then you will use RDS. If it goes over that, if it goes over that, then you will have to use another solution. Now, when you have more than, than a single worker node or shard, and we see shard like partitions, right? When you have more than one single node or, or shard, then you will have to use something else. You can now use RDS. So RDS can now have um, more than, than a single worker node or shard. And if you want something that is highly, highly durable, then RDS is the case. Okay, when not to use it? Well, if you have massive reader writes rates, for example, 150,000 write per second, well, then you can now use RDS. Because RDS um, is sir. So, sir, okay. I know you say shard and you say something about port, um, partition, but I don't know exactly. We, we're gonna talk about partitions later. Partitions when you come, uh, separate, segment your disk in different partitions. So, I haven't talked about partition yet. Just mentioned it. In mathematics, a partition of a set is grouping of its elements into non-empty subsets. It's like, for example, this is a partition, you see? This is a, this is a bathroom, right? But it's like, this is the whole thing, right? And then you partition that into three. Right? That's what you meant by chart? Chart is the same. It's also so, chart. partition. So you did. So you just divide the memory in, or capacity and say this is to um, save for such and such. Yes, you don't use. I mean, the term partition, partition in shards is more used in DynamoDB, right? And also um, elastic cache. In elastic cache. Working with shards. A shard is a collection of one to six Redis nodes. A Redis cluster mode disabled cluster will never have more than one shard. Okay. So we're gonna get when we get to DynamoDB, we're gonna see partitions more. But partition is just a little collection, little segmentation of a unit. It's like a unit, like the image that we saw here, right? Uh, let me see if I can have like probably a disk or something.
You see the partitions here? Yes. You see? This is the entire, you know, the entire computer, the entire thing, right? This is the hard drive, right? But you can partition the hard drive in different small devices and drives. See? It's like uh, cementing a unit into small pieces. That's the partition. Okay? And it can improve the performance uh, remarkably as well. Okay? So, <clears throat> Sharding, sharding is the process of creating more shards, like scaling, like creating re-replicas in an RDS instance, or creating more servers in order scaling. Sharding is the same concept. So there's a lot of there's a lot of data, right? The data is growing, or the throughput uh, is high, the demand of throughput high. What do you what you do is simply you shard shard you create more shards and then it's like it's the same concept behind free replicas what happens if you want to you know offload the the all the requests from this database only you create a re-replica and then it will be both right both the same concept behind sharding is the same the database is getting a lot of requests and then you shard it means that you create more small small partitions of that of that database, and then you start having more requests. Okay, shard the concept is just the, like duplicating, uh, having more duplicate, right? Of that uh, shard, so you can have better throughput in the database. Okay, do not use RDS for single get or put requests and queries that a NoSQL database can handle. Okay, if the get and put can be handled by NoSQL database, then you use RDS because the RDS is SQL. Uh, this is NoSQL. So relational database management system customization. If you need to customize your database, then RDS is not good. Because RDS is it has a schema, it has it, it's rigid. It's not it's not flexible. No SQL databases, unstructured database, the unstructured databases, they are more flexible than RDS. So you cannot customize it. Um, so you cannot customize RDS. That's what I tried to say. RDS, this is the clock hour billing and database characteristics. You are um resource incurred charges when running by hour okay it's like i said before if you have a database an rds and the rds is running and you stop it right thinking that by stopping it you're going to save money i'm sorry you're not going to be charged you're wrong you're going to save money but you're going to be charged for storage okay <clears throat> of course when it's running you're going to be charged too Now, database characteristics, physical capacity of database. You have an engine. The engine you have to you have to select it. We have six engines. We saw it before: Amazon Aurora, Microsoft SQL Server, PostgreSQL, MariaDB, Oracle, and DB. Those are the DB engines, right? So, the engine, the size, how big your database is, and the memory class the memory class as well. The purchase type, you can have on-demand instances, just like, like uh, EC2 instances, and the compute capacity by the hour. Right? You can also have reserve instances, just like EC2 instances. And you have low one-time upfront payment for database instance that are reserved with one year or three year term, just like exactly like um, easy two instances. The number of DB instances provision multiple DB instances to handle peak loads, okay? Also, also you're gonna be charged for that, depending on that. You're gonna be charged depending on the provision storage. There is no charge for a backup storage of up to 100 
percent of database storage for an active uh, database. So if you have an active database, you're not going to be charged for storage for backup storage. Okay, for backup storage. And then if you're charged, you're going to be charged for uh, per gigabyte per month, right? So if you have a database that is terminated, you're going to be you're going to be charged for backup storage. So you see how contradictory this is, but that's the way it is. So if the instance is running, you don't get charged for backup storage. If the instance is terminated, you get charged for backup storage. Okay. There's some additional storage as well. Uh, you're gonna be charged for it, right? And then you're gonna be charged for, just one moment. You're gonna be charged for a uh, gigabyte per month of backup storage backup storage uh, in addition to provision storage. Okay. Also, depending on the deployment type and data transfer, request the number of input and output requests that are made to the database. You're gonna be charged based on that. The deployment type, well, if it is single availability zone or multiple availability zone. If you choose multi-AZ, you're gonna be charged more than if you use a single availability zone. The more high available you are, the more you're going to be charged. Right? Data transfer, there's no charge for inbound data transfer, but for outbound data transfer, depending on how much you're transferring. Okay, there's tier charges for that, depending. There's a lab, guys, that you can do is open, build your DB, build your DB server, and interact with your DB using an application. The last scenario is the following. You have, it's designed to show you how to use an AWS managed database instance to solve a need for relational database, right? All of these components are gonna be in the lab. You're gonna have an internet, uh, internet gateway. You're gonna have a NAT gateway in availability zone A. You're gonna have a web server with a security group in availability zone B. You're going to have four subnets, public subnet one, public subnet two, private subnet one, private subnet two, right? You're going to have this. You're going to, you have to create, create a VPC security group, create a database subnet group, create an Amazon RDS database instance and interact with your database. The final product is going to be the following. Okay, so you're going to have a security group, right? A web server. So basically what you're going to launch is an RDS database instance with high availability. Configure a database instance to permit connections from, you know, from your server and open a web application and interact it interact with your database. Do it guys, that's gonna be helpful for you. Let's have a demo of RDS, okay? Sorry. Okay, so let me have a demo. Just give me one second. Okay. Hi, I'm Matt from Amazon Web Services, and in this short video, I'm going to give you a guided tour of one of our database products, the Amazon Relational Database Service, or RDS. 
RDS is a web service which makes it easy to set up, operate, and scale relational databases. We lost the screen. It provides the familiar capabilities of MySQL or Oracle databases without the common time-consuming database administration tasks associated with a relational database. This means that you can spend less time on the undifferentiated heavy lifting of administering your database service and more time focusing on your applications and your customers. Amazon RDS has advanced features which are available to anyone in just a few API calls or a couple of clicks in the AWS web-based management console. It supports rapid provisioning of relational databases in a utility computing environment. Just as electricity is delivered to you as a utility service, where you can consume what you need when you need it and only pay when you're using it, so MySQL and Oracle databases are available in a similar manner via RDS. RDS database instances are available on demand with metered billing based on the capacity you consume. RDS databases offer scalable storage under the hood so you can provision additional storage capacity for your databases as and when you need it. It provides high availability options, allowing you to provision databases which span data centers that are redundantly powered and connected, providing a redundant database service to your application and customers, again, in just a few clicks. It's also possible to quickly yes, increase the professor. Okay, well, additional well, uh, resources available. You're not seeing that? I'm sharing the screen. We are no. hearing, but we are not seeing. We are seeing the slides. Exactly. Or to your databases, including CPU and memory. This means that you can increase the on launch DB instance and then select the database engine, in this case, MySQL. We can then select some parameters for our database the database engine version, the instance class, this is the size of the underlying resources for our database, and whether we want to run across availability zones. And it takes a few minutes, but we'll skip forward to when our database is ready for use. So there we have a MySQL database deployed and ready for use in just a few minutes. Elements such as text or pictures. It's called Clarity, and it will persist the users, page information, relationship, and page all right, let me just do it myself, okay? Because the demo that we have here is a little old, okay? Okay. So what I can do is just come here, right? And in the database, I can create, I can choose this, uh, the engine, right? And then in the engine, Right, I let me choose my SQL. Okay, then in my SQL, I'm gonna choose the. If I want to choose the latest version, and here I can choose production development, development, testing, or free tier. Okay, so here I have to put the database identifier, the database username, the master username, the master password, confirm the password. And now I'm going to choose the instance size. I have different instance sizes here that I can choose. And then I'm going to choose the storage type. I have SDD, general purpose, provision IOPS, and magnetic. I can choose the amount of provision IOPS, uh, IOPS that I want. The maximum is $80,000, 80,000 uh, IOPS. So I can say 80,000 IOPS. Okay. Now I can choose or storage or scaling, just in case it needs to scale up or scale uh, out, you know, improve the storage, right? I can create multi-AZ and this will create a standby, standby uh, in a different availability zone to provide data redundancy, eliminate input output freezers and, freezes and minimize latency spikes during system backups, okay? I can make it publicly accessible if I want to. I can choose a security group, right? That I can choose for that, right? The VPC, if I have one, I can use it. I'm gonna use the default one. Then I can have password authentication and it's gonna cost me $8,524 a month, okay? But that's not the most expensive one. If I choose my SQL server, right? And I choose the enterprise edition, 
it's going to cost me uh, $11,414 a month, $50 a month. But if I try to play with this and I choose 64, which is the I, the, the I, the, the, and then I want to allocate probably 30,000 gigabytes. Well, the, the, this is this thing, 384, right? That's the highest I can go. Okay, and then uh, it's gonna cost me 13,000. That's, that's a lot of money for a database, right? Okay. Oh, uh, okay. What is the allocated storage value? Okay, so here it has to be 16, 384, actually. 300, 16,000. This one is fine now. So now if I see the price, it's 12,000. 12, okay, so it's gonna be multi-AC, always on. Okay, so I can just use whatever I want to you guys and make it more expensive. And if you click create database, well, that's gonna be a problem. Let me choose here, a bigger uh, instant size, right? And we say that the price is gonna be increased to $90,753 a month, okay? So that's the database, okay? You create that and you're gonna be charged based on the engine, okay? You're gonna be charged based on the, the instant size, the storage type, right? And if it is multi-AZ or no, okay, right? Of course, the free tier, the free tier doesn't have the free tier doesn't have. Can you click on Oracle? Oracle? Well, it's gonna be expensive as well. We have all of these options here, right? It doesn't have a free tier. It's not included in the free tier, right? And then it's gonna cost you. $13,641. <clears throat> but if you have this power in another database on premises, you can bet that it's going to be more expensive than this. This looks expensive, but when you compare it to all the solutions that have the same features and the same storage and, and, and type, all that, it's going to be cheaper. Okay. The one that has the free tier is Postgres MySQL. Then you can choose the free tier here. And then the free tier doesn't include multi-AZ. As you can see here, it's, it doesn't have multi-AZ, okay? And that's basically it to create a database. <clears throat> so with Amazon RDS, you can set up, operate and scale relational databases in the cloud. The features is a managed service accessible via the console at WS command line interface. That's a CLI or application programming interface or API calls, right? So scalable, you can scale the compute power. You can scale the storage. Automated redundancy and backup are available. Supported database engines. Uh, the supported Aurora, PostgreSQL, MySQL, MariaDB, Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server. Okay. Well, let's talk about this heavy duty guy. 
Do you have any questions, guys, about RDS? Any questions? No. Well, let's compare this first, relational databases versus non-relational databases. Okay. Well, relational databases, is, it has a concept of rows and columns, right? Whereas, I mean, relation, non-relational database is a key value document or graph, right? In the case of, in the case of um, DynamoDB, you have a key value pair. So you have key value, key value, key value, key value, okay? But in the case of relational database, you have columns, columns, and rows, columns and rows. That concept doesn't exist in non-relational databases. Okay, you will not see in you will not see in Cassandra or MongoDB or DynamoDB. You're not going to see this concept of columns and rows. You will see uh, key value pairs. Right. The schema in relational database is fixed, so every single row is going to have the same columns. Right. Unless, unless it is a value that it is a column that has a not null and not null constraint. So you don't have to put a value. But if it says, if it is not null, I'm sorry, if it says null, then you'd have to put the value. If it said not null, then you have to put a value. Okay. In the case of non relational databases, it doesn't have a fixed schema. It has a dynamic schema. It's a different schema. So it's absolutely crazy because we are used to seeing this guy, right? But this guy is so powerful. Are you going to see why people use DynamoDB so much, right? This one uses SQL, and this one will focus on collection of documents. So one of the, the technologies that you can use for non-relational database is GraphQL. I don't know if you guys know GraphQL. GraphQL is a technology that is used to query the DynamoDB. GraphQL is a very quite new, um, it was published in 2015. It's very popular to query uh, databases. And of course, it uses JSON for that, right? But it's super nice. I like it. Um, it supports these languages. So you can use JavaScript and use this guy here. But if you want to query a database, you know, it's uh, it's super cool the way that it works, okay? right? You can learn of this guys if you feel like it. Uh, I strongly recommend it. GraphQL, okay? And the way that this guy scales is vertical, vertically, right? And this guy uh, will scale horizontally, okay? So vertically is more power, horizontally you increase the number of, of them, right? So what is Amazon DynamoDB? Where it's fast and flexible, no SQL database service for any scale, any scale. That's something that is great. It's any scale. It doesn't, it, it's not subjected to any scale, to a specific scale. It's, it could be any scale. Um, it has no SQL database tables, virtually unlimited storage. Items can have differing attributes and low latency queries, scalable read and write throughput, right? Amazon will manage all the underlying uh, data infrastructure for this service and redundantly stores data across multiple facilities in a native US region as part of the fault tolerant architecture, right? With Animal Dynamo, with Animal DB, you can create tables and items. So this doesn't have columns and rows. It has tables and items, right? You can add items to a table. The system automatically partitions your data and has stable storage to meet workload requirements. 
there's no practical limit on the number of items that you can store in a table. For instance, some customers have production tables that contain billions of items. Okay. So one of the benefits of uh, NoSQL database is that the items in the in the same table can have different attributes. Right. This gives you the flexibility to add attributes as your application evolves. You can store newer format items side by side with older format items in the same table without needing to perform a schema migrations, right? So let me real quick create a database here, a DynamoDB database. Let me create a table real, real quick here. I'm gonna call it um, MDCC table, right? The partition key, which is also known as the primary key in a relational database, right? Primary key partition key is gonna be ID, right? You can also have a sort key if you want to. A sort key is something that is gonna help you to sort uh, the database. It could be a date, it could be a score, something like that that you can, you can, you can sort. I don't need that. And then if you decide not to use the default settings, then you can come here and change the read capacity units, right? And the write capacity units. You can use the default values or you can just modify it here and do whatever you want, right? You can have encrypted data all that. So I'm gonna just use the default settings. I'm gonna create a table and this is how easy it is, right? So now the table has been created, it's right here. I can have the items here, I can create an item. Metrics, I have metrics here from CloudWatch. I have alarms, I have the capacity here, indexes, global tables, I can make this table global. I have all the uh, tables, backups. Right? I can have contributor insights, triggers, access control, and tags. Right. So let me create an item real quick here. Item. So let me say that the ID is going to be 001. I'm going to add uh, the first name. So Ludieski here, I'm going to add the last thing. That's Adam. I'm going to add phone, right? Okay, now let me save it. Then I have this guy here. Okay, this is an item that has four attributes, ID, first first name, last name, phone, okay? Let me create another, another item. Always we have an ID because that's the partition key, okay? Zero, zero, two. And now I'm gonna say, uh, maybe gender, male, maybe, uh, Okay, I'm gonna say maybe H, 44, maybe address, that's it, save. You see how flexible this is? Now I'm gonna have an item gonna be 003, and this one is gonna have computer size, big computer color, blue computer type.
You see? <laughs> this is this just breaks that conception that we have of relational databases. It has a dynamic schema. It doesn't follow a fixed one, fixed schema. And now you can work with this, right? You can work with this now. So as your application becomes more popular and its users continue to interact with you with it, your storage can grow with your application needs and all the data in DynamoDB store and on solid state drive SSD and its simple query language enables consistent low latency query performance. Okay. Now this table, I can make it global. So I can create a global table. So I will enable streams, right? And now I can just add a region, right? So I can say, let me say that I want to create this in Ohio. I create a replica. And that's it. So now I can go to that table and it takes me to Ohio. Ohio here. And I see my table, right? Okay. That would be on the table. Okay, but it was telling me that my table was there. Oh, it's still updating, that's why. Okay. So it has auto scaling, it's by default encrypted, right? It has the partition key here, right? And we're gonna wait for this guy to, to finish, okay? Amazon DynamoDB core components, tables, items, and attributes are the core DynamoDB components, tables, items, and attributes. In relational databases, table, columns, and rows. Here is items and attributes. A table is a collection of items, and an item is a collection of attributes. What is the attribute? Well, the attribute is the attributes is this, this. Well, we know as columns, right? In relational databases, address, age, all that, this is the attribute. And the item is the row, right? The item is what we know as row in relational databases. Still updating, right? Still updating. We're gonna go to Ohio later and see what happens in Ohio, okay? See, I did it. Okay. It's a global table, you know, you have to update. Now it supports two different kinds of primary keys. You have the partition key, which was what I used. It does the primary key. It has to be a unique key and it has partition and sort key. It ha can have a combination of, of both, of the partition key and the sort key. And this is also known as a uh, compound key in relation to databases when you have two primary keys that form one, okay? Now the partition is just, as data grows, table partition by key, right? The query by key to find items efficiently scanned to find items by any attributes. So you can retrieve the data from DynamoDB in two different ways, okay? The first method is the query operation takes advantage of partitioning to effectively locate items by using the primary key. So it just separate the type tables in small, small pieces. And then through the key, you can find that item real quick. Okay. So if I come here to my table right, and I try to query that, I can query that. And I can say partition key just fall find the one that says 001, right? 
and then go ahead and where's my where's my cursor okay okay we start search and then we find this guy okay it just uses the partition key it just splits automatically splits the, the table in little pieces it partitions that by the key but that partition key it can find the item okay so we can say this right and then if we want to add a filter like enter attribute h and that equals 44 okay right and then you can be a little more specific and then find uh mm -hmm. this number oh yes yes thank you thank you appreciate that thank you because there's the type the type of the age is number thank you appreciate that so now the table has been updated it, it is not is not just uh, doing this anymore so if i refresh this page i see the table here in ohio is being created okay so that's the concept of global tables okay and that's also known as three replicas for DynamoDB, creating a replica there as well. One moment. So the second me me uh, method is via a scan, right? But the scan is going to be slower because it had to scan the table, right? I, it will enable you to locate items in the table of matching conditions on known key non-key attributes. So it doesn't use the key, the, the primary key. It gives you the flexibility to locate the item by other attributes. However, the operation is less efficient because DynamoDB will scan through all the items in the table to find the ones that match your criteria. Okay, so let me go back to where I was here, items, and then I can choose scan, right? And then I it will find the same thing here but my table only has three items, right? My table only has three items. So if you take a look at my table, right? I only have three items, right? Let me see here. I only have three items. So that's nothing. But Im Im imagine that I have billions and billions of items, right? So a scan is gonna be a little inefficient, right? But that's another method that you can find uh, items with. Items in the table must have a key. A key is mandatory. The sort key is not, but the key is. So you have the key, the partition key, right? And the key will uniquely identify items in the DynamoDB. It has to be unique. So you can set up a simple primary key that is based on a single attribute of the data values with a uniform distribution, like a global unique identifier or any other random identifier, something that what could be a good key to identify a person? Well, a social security number, right? A driver's license ID, right? For example, if you wanted to make a model or to model a table with products, you could use some attributes like the product ID, or you can simply use a compound key, which is composed of a partition key and a secondary key. And in this example, if you had a table with books, for example, you might use the combination of the author and the title to uniquely identify the table items. Okay, this table here, sorry. The table items. Okay. So this method could be useful if you expect to frequently look at books by author because you can then you square it, okay? So you have a partition key and a sort key. Something that makes something unique, two items that make something unique. 
So I, I, the Amazon DynamoDB, it runs exclusively on SSD. It supports documents and key value store model. Remember, if you take a look at, let me see here. If you wanna see, let's see if I wanna see this guy and then I wanna watch this in a text mode, you see? That's Jason. So if I click on DynamoDB Jason, this is Jason. So we have a, a key and a value, a value a key, a value a key, a value a key, right? That's Jason, right? If you see in your exam, they ask you about a table that uses Jason, that will be DynamoDB, okay? It replicates your table automatically across your choice of AWS region. We just did that. It works well for mobile, web, gaming, ad tech, and Internet of Things, IoT applications. Uh, it's accessible via the console, the AWS CLI, and the API calls. Provides consistent, consistent single DG millisecond, single DG millisecond latency at any scale, and has no limits on table size of throughput. Well, you see this guy here, DAX, it's also, known, it's, it's also known as DynamoDB Accelerator. DynamoDB, it will take under 10 milliseconds to respond, okay? It's a single unit, single digit millisecond latency, right? <laughs> Dynamo Accelerator takes microseconds, is many times more faster than a single digit millisecond. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now, I want to delete this table. And I don't know why I see it updating. So let me, I don't know why I see it updating. Uh, well, when I finish updating, I will delete it, okay? Demo's already done. Well, this is a recorded demo. Why not? How long is it? Two minutes, okay, that's good. In this setup demonstration, I'll show you how to create a table in DynamoDB. Let's take a look at the data we want to store first. Here I have a JSON file, which is a product catalog. The products have lots of different attributes, but one thing they have in common is this ID number. Let's go back to the console and create the table. So my table name will be product catalog. The partition key will be the ID, which is a number. And I can just click Create. It's very simple. That's all I need to do to create a new table. If I click on Items, we can see there's nothing at the moment in this table. I'll use the CLI to populate the table. So I'll open a window, which is a PowerShell for AWS. And first of all, I'll just list the tables that I've got. So I'm using the list tables command and I've specified the region I'm using. And there you can see I've got one table called product catalog. Now I'll query that table with a describe table and the table name and the region again. And you can see it shows me the details about my table the total table size at the moment is zero. The partition key we're using is the ID, which is a number. Let's try adding my data into this table now. I'm using batch write item. And I'll use a file for where to get the data from. That's the path to my file name. And lastly, the region again. Back in the console, let's refresh this page. And there you can see all of my products are now in the table. I could even do a query in my table. I could look for everything where my number is this page. And then this is where it my file name. This is very interesting. And lastly, the region again. Back in the console, let's refresh this page. And there you can see all of my products are now in the table. 
I could even do a query in my table. I could look for everything where my number is, for example, 204. And there's the one item that matches that. So it's very simple. We've created a table and we've populated that table with some items using the AWS CLI. To see how, uh, how easy it is, it's not, it's not difficult, it's not complex. Okay, um, let me see if I can do the same here in my CLI, right? So I can do clear, right? Clear. And now I'm going to just do that and make this bigger. Right? And I can say AWS DynamoDB. Uh, list tables, right? And I have the MDCC table, right? I didn't specify the region because I only have one, right? So that will be one, right? Now, maybe I wanna say now, AWS DynamoDB, but now I'm going to describe tables or describe table. In this case, I'm going to say table name. And the table name is, I think it's MDC table, right? And then I get all the information from there. have the attributes here. Okay. Now maybe, let me see if I can find it. I think I, I have a JSON file somewhere here. I think I have a JSON file here somewhere. I think that, Okay, probably here, JSON, JSON, copy, paste item. Did it paste it? Did it paste it? Oh, I didn't. Where is it? Did it paste it, right? Okay. So I can open this guy, company probably with Adam, right? Oh, this is not JSON. Wait, let's see if I can find I go something with JSON. Maybe I can say, uh, make it, maybe I can, just real quick, I can say nano uh, file.json. And maybe I can do this. I can say name. This is just JSON, guys. Yes, key. I'm going to say first name. Let's name a tunnel. And 
now I can have I can have another one. And another one. Right? And now I can say maybe I can say here uh, maybe I can say here phone. If you see if it works. Computer. Here your number. And then here I can say probably uh, yeah I don't think this is gonna work uh, the, the file were that yeah uh, let me see the file that you had let me see a file that he showed there. Did he show the file? He showed the file. Uh, okay. Table and the well, the total table size at the moment is zero. The partition key we're using is the ID, which is a number. Let's try adding my data into this table now. Oh. I'm oh. using batch write item. And I'll use a file for where to get the data from. That's the path to my file name, and lastly, the region again. Yep. Back in the console, let's refresh this page. And there you can see all of my products are now in the table. I could even do a query in my table. I could look for it. No, that would not work. I have to create the table first, and then based on that, I have to create the, uh, the file. Don't worry, don't worry about that. I was just improvising here. Okay. But it should work. All you need is the ID. Uh, yes, but um, yeah, but it's better to have the table empty and then inject the, the, the data. It's better that way. Right? If I want to do it that way, if I want to do it that way. Oh, the table has to be empty, so you're saying? No, it doesn't have to be empty, but uh, it will be for. The sake of this demonstration would have been better if it had been empty. So, and, and it had the file prepared, okay? In his demonstration, it was empty, right? So it's easier, it's much easier if you have that separated in a, in a file, and then you can reuse that file anytime you want, right? Because if you do this manually, then you would have to do some work around here to be able to save that in a file, right? But if you have the data in a file that you can update anytime you want, right? You can reuse that data to create all the tables, right? It just, it just, it, it just approach that you take, you know? You can do that way you want. In my case, I need to think about it, okay? I'm just missing the ID, that's correct, because the ID has to be there, right? But, you know, uh, you have to think about it and do it correctly, not improvise, you know? Okay, so, good. Okay, so Amazon Redshift. Well, Redshift is, is, a, is a warehouse, a data warehouse. It's fast, fully managed data warehouse that, that makes, uh, make everything, makes everything simple and cost effective to analyze all of your data by using standard SQL and your existing business intelligence tool, BI tools, right? And let's take a look at Redshift and how you can use it for analytic applications, okay? So analytics is important for business data today, okay? 
but building a data warehouse is complex and expensive. Data warehouses can take months and significant financial resources to set up. Amazon Redshift is a fast and is fast, fast and powerful, fully managed data warehouse that is simple and cost effective to set up, use, and scale. It enables you to run complex analytic queries against petabytes of structured data because it uses SQL, right? And it uses sophisticated query optimization, columnar storage, columnar in columns storage on high performance local disks and massively parallel data processing. So when you do this with the right shift, most results come back in seconds. It's super fast. Let's just explore a little more in detail um, the key Amazon Redshift features and some of the use cases. Okay. Parallel processing. Well, the little, the little node, see here the little node, it manages communications with client programs and all communications with compute nodes. It parses and develops plans to carry out database operations specifically, and the series of steps that are needed to obtain results for complex queries. Now the little node will compile the code for individual elements of the plan and assigns the code to individual compute nodes. The compute nodes run the compile code and send immediate results back to the little node for final aggregation. Like any other AWS service, you only pay for what you use. You can get started for as little as 20 cents per hour and scale Amazon Redshift and it can deliver storage and processing for approximately $1,000 per terabyte per year. This is with the three year partial upfront reserved instance pricing. So you can also have reserved instance with Redshift as well. Now Redshift has something called Redshift Spectrum, right? It's a feature that enables you to run queries against exabytes of data directly into S3. Now, it is straightforward to automate most of the common administrative tasks to manage, monitor, and scale your Amazon Redshift cluster. It's very straightforward. And it enable you, enables you to focus on your data and your business. Guys, whenever you see managed services, you can you only have to worry about your business and the management of data. That's it. The rest is done by AWS. AWS will manage it, monitor it, and scale it. Scalability is intrinsic in Amazon Redshift. Your cluster can be scaled up and down as your needs change with a few clicks in the console. Security is the highest priority for AWS. So with Amazon Redshift, the security is built in and it is designed to provide strong encryption of your data, both at rest and in transit. So encryption is default, it's by default. And finally, Amazon Redshift is compatible with tools that you already know and use. It supports standard SQL. It also provides high performance Java database connectivity, JDBC, and open database connectivity, ODBC connectors. And that would enable you to use the SQL clients and business intelligent tools of your choice. Now let's see one of the use cases of, some of the use cases of Amazon Redshift. Well, this slide discuss some of the use cases of Redshift. Many customers migrate their traditional enterprise data warehouses to Amazon Redshift with the primary goal of agility. Okay. Customers can start at whatever scale they want and experiment with their data 
without needing to rely on complicated processes with their IT departments to procure and prepare their software. Big data customers have only one thing in common, massive amounts of data that stretch their existing, existing systems to a breaking point. Smaller customers might have the resources to procure the hardware and expertise that is needed to run these systems. So with Amazon Redshift, smaller customers can quickly set up and use a data warehouse at a comparatively low price point. As a managed service, Redshift handles many of the deployment and ongoing maintenance tasks that often require a database administrator. So this enables customers to focus on querying and analyzing the data only. Okay. You know, focus on more data, more data and less on database management. Okay. They're taking a lot of responsibility off of you and you're just leaving the responsibility to AWS. Now, software service customers can take advantage of the scalable, easy to manage features that Amazon Redshift provides. Some customers use the Amazon Redshift to provide analytic capabilities to their applications. Some users deploy a cluster per customer and use tagging to simplify and manage their service level agreements and billing. Amazon Redshift can help you reduce hardware and software costs. Guys, every solution that we see with AWS, every solution, it's always to reduce cost. It's intended to reduce cost. Otherwise, what's the point? Right. We're not gonna see Redshift if in, in depth because remember that, she, I mean, this is the foundational part of AWS. This is more for big data, big data um, certifications. Probably some, probably some solutions like it and development. Uh, mostly big data. Okay. So, key takeaways of this section is fast, fully managed data warehouse service, easily scale with no downtime columnar storage and parallel processing architectures, automatically and continuously monitors cluster, and encryption is built in. Okay. Aurora. Guys, don't play, don't play too much with Aurora because Aurora is gonna cost you some money, right? Is in my SQL, this is my SQL and Postgres compatible relational database that is built for the cloud. It combines the performance and availability of high-end commercial databases with the simplicity and cost-effectiveness of open source databases. Using Amazon Aurora can reduce your database cost while improving the reliability and availability of your database. As a fully managed service, Aurora is designed to automate time-consuming tasks like provisioning, patching, backup, recovery, failure detection, and repair, okay? Benefits, well, it's a managed service. It's fast and available. It's simple, it's compatible, and you pay as you go, right? You pay for what you use, right? One of the things that make Aurora highly available is as soon as you create Aurora cluster, it will create six copies for you in three different availability zones automatically. So by default, you become highly available, right? You pay as you go, right? It means that you only pay for the services that feature and features that you use. It integrates with features such as AWS Data Migration Service, DMS, and the AWS Schema Conversion Tool. These features are designed to help you move your database into Amazon Aurora. So you can move from 
you know, on-premises to the cloud, right? And you could use the data migration service, also known as the EMS, and the schema conversion tool, SCT, okay, as well. Say so compatible with uh, MySQL and MySQL and PostgreSQL, right? So it uses SQL. So this is what happens when you create uh, an Amazon Aurora cluster, okay? So why might you use Aurora over all the options like SQL with Amazon RDS? So most of that decision involves the high availability and resilient design that Amazon Aurora offers. It is designed to be highly available. It stores multiple copies of your data across multiple availability zones with continuous backups to Amazon S3. So it backs up by itself. Every time you make a change or something happens, you write something new, it backs it up and it sends it to Amazon S3, okay? It can create up to, it can use up to 15 re-replicas. And that can reduce the possibility of losing data. On top of that, Aurora is designed for instant crash recovery if your primary database becomes unhealthy. Guys, just listen to me. Instant crash recovery. Isn't that great? That's amazing, right? But it's going to cost you. Now, after a database crash, crash, Amazon Aurora does not need to replay the redo log from the last database checkpoint. Instead, it performs this on every read operation. This reduces the restart time after a database crash to less than 60 seconds in most cases. So with Amazon Aurora, the buffer cache if is moved out of the database process, which makes it available immediately at restart. And this reduces the need for you to throttle access until the cache is repopulated to avoid brownouts. See guys, guys, how resilient uh, Aurora is. Okay, six copies in three different availability zones, up to 15 replicas, re-replicas, right? It has instant crash recovery if the primary database becomes unhealthy, right? Every read operation, the redo log file is replayed, right? And then it will reduce your restart uh, time after database crashes to less than 60 seconds. So it's super fast, okay? So that's all we need to know about Aurora. Not much for now. Just don't play with it, okay? It may cost you. Okay. So Amazon Aurora features, high performance and scalability, um, high availability and durability, multiple levels of security, compatible with MySQL and PostgreSQL, and it's fully managed. Okay. The right tool for the right job, what are my requirements? Well, if it is an enterprise class relational database, then you can use Amazon RDS. If it is, you need something fast and flexible, no SQL database for any scale, Amazon DynamoDB. If it has to do with uh, operating system access or application features that are not supported by AWS database services, then you can use databases on Amazon EC2. That's what we did two Saturdays ago. And specific case driven requirements, machine learning, data warehouse graphs, well, AWS purpose built database services.
Okay, this is another case study. A data protection and management company that provides services to enterprise that must provide database uh, services uh, for over 55 petabytes of data. They have two types of data that require a database solution. First, they need a relational database store for, uh, for configuration data. Second, they need a store for unstructured metadata to support a deduplication service after uh, that. Okay, guys, what do you think is this one? Relational database, what do you think is this one? Dynamo DB. Relational? Dynamo DB is not relational. RDS. RDS. And this one? Take a look at this. MongoDB? No. No. You are in the cloud. Right, MongoDB is not supported by AWS. Okay. What what unstructured met metadata? What is that? What's unstructured. That? It's DynamoDB. DynamoDB. You know, unstructured means that it doesn't have a fixed, a schema. You know. A commercial shipping company that uses an on-premises legacy database uh, data management system, they must migrate to a serviceless ecosystem, while they continue to use their existing database system which is based on Oracle. They are also in the process of decomposing their highly structured relational database into a semi-structured data, data and the following data illustrate the architecture. Semi is structured. Which one is that? You just mentioned it. Is that Dynamo also? Correct. DynamoDB is unstructured or semi-structured, both. And, and they are they are going to a serverless ecosystem. DynamoDB is used for serverless application. Remember that RDS uses a server, right? RDS is a server, right? It's not serverless. Serverless is DynamoDB, right? Another case study, an online payment processing company that processes over 1 million transactions per day, they must provide system services to e-commerce customers who uh, offer flash sales, sales that offer greatly reduced prices for a limited time, where, the, where demand can increase by 30 times in a short time period. They use IM, an AWS KMS, key management system, service, I'm sorry, to authenticate some transactions with financial institution. They need high throughput for these peak loads and the following diagram illustrates their architecture. What do you think it is? This tells us what it is. RDS. RDS. Okay, this is RDS. Okay. Well, any questions, guys? I think it's been pretty straightforward. Okay. So, so in summer, in this module, you learn how to explain Amazon relational databases, Amazon RDS, database services, RDS, identify the functionality uh, in Amazon RDS, explain Amazon DynamoDB, identify the functionality in Amazon DynamoDB, explain Amazon Redshift, explain Amazon Aurora and perform tasks in RDS database, such as launching, configuring, and interacting. Okay. I didn't launch the, Dynamo, the database because it will take some time to create. And also we're not planning to do anything after that, but we configured it. Question here, which of the following is a fully managed NoSQL database? The keyword is NoSQL database. Guys, you know the answer. Which one is it? 
DynamoDB. That whenever it says no SQL, that is DynamoDB. Okay, there you go. I'm gonna copy these guys. Additional resources. Right. 